ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode 184 of the Spearhead Sundays podcast in the brand new set. Would you look at that? There's a big thing of me flipping you off. What more would you actually want from this podcast other than a normal human version of me who's flipping you off next to a massive cardboard uh, cardboard, a massive drawing of me flipping you off, all right? Did I mess up the very start by saying cardboard instead of illustration? Yes, I did. Am I going to start again? No, because let's be honest, if I gave all of the new people who are listening to this show uh, for the very first time because we've revamped the set and I'm promoting it, if I gave them the impression that this was a professional podcast, Can you imagine how fucking disappointed they would be by the third episode they listened to? They'd be like, oh man, this podcast looks great. And the guy did uh, his first episode in a new set perfectly, didn't fuck up anything. And everything he said was correct and well-researched. This is bullshit. What's happened? It started off so well. Guys, welcome to one of the worst podcasts uh, on the internet that uh, looks quite nice now, finally. For, for years, I've been recording this podcast with a piece of shit camera in a piece of shit location, and it just looks like garbage. Like I'm recording it on a fucking casting couch in, in my mother's garage. And let me tell you something. The location hasn't changed. I am still in a fucking warehouse surrounded by brothels and murderers. But what I have done, like many things I've done in my, in my life, is instead of actually improving the situation, what I've done instead of doing that, instead of actually closing the massive wound uh, that is the warehouse situation, instead of actually fixing it, I've instead bought a Hello Kitty Band-Aid and put that over the top of it. That looks nice, doesn't it? Huh? And now, now this place looks really great. It's not, and the, po- and the content within this podcast is quite garbage, but it looks very nice. Basically, what I'm saying, right, is this podcast right now is like a really beautiful woman, right? You look at the beautiful woman and you go, wow, she looks amazing. She's gorgeous. I can't wait to find out how beautiful her personality is. And then you get inside and you're like, well, what a cunt. This woman sucks. She doesn't have to be good because she looks good. And that's this podcast. Doesn't have to be good because look, it looks awesome. <laughs> a welcome if you're new. If you listening to the audio version, I highly recommend you come check out the YouTube version. I'm in a brand new set. Got my, got my new yelling chair. Shout out to Ikea, right? And I got, I got a real good practice run trying to build this fucking thing, screaming at it. My girlfriend, Jazz, built most of it. She asked me for help with one step and I almost demolished it. I almost undid all of her hard work because I had to do one thing and it frustrated me and they give you a little fucking tool that's too small for my massive long hands. So I uh, almost smashed it, but I didn't. I am sitting in it. I did, uh, I did uh, only 70% complete the task she gave me. So if the chair does fall apart at any point, let it be known completely my fault but but do I regret 70% completing the job absolutely not I would say that 100% of my IKEA furniture is 70% completed let's be honest if you really if you build everything right properly if you follow all of the steps if you do everything 100% correct you're a fool yeah IKEA's trying to fucking fool you you're wasting man hours do you really need four supports what about three does the job hey Maybe, you know what, maybe I don't need all four supports, right? Being, being the longest and lightest man in comedy, maybe I don't need all three supports. If you're sitting there and you're listening to this, shaking your head, thinking, you know what, maybe I don't need all four supports. If you're sitting there thinking that, but you also weigh 200 kilos and uh, eat uh, donuts for breakfast, maybe, maybe don't listen to my advice. It works for me, but I wouldn't prescribe it to, ev- to everyone. You know what I mean? If, if, you're under, if you're under 80 kilos like me, follow the advice if if you if you uh get fucking milkshakes with breakfast maybe not you know 
So uh, I've been having a, been having a good time, man. Uh, I finally got back into into the channel. I finally got back into uh, making videos. It's all going well. If you would like to see me, my regional tour is on sale now. And Jesus Christ, you would think with the brand new launch of my fucking podcast, you'd think I would have the dates in front of me, wouldn't you? And you know what? I, I specifically remember thinking, man, make sure you read out the dates before you start it. I'm going to be... In February, a massive regional Australia in uh, Warrnambool, Ballarat, Shepparton, Wagga Wagga, Bathurst, Central Coast, Port Macquarie, Toowoomba, Bundaberg, Rockhampton, Mackay, Townsville and Cairns with my friend Luke Kidgel with our Hit the Road tour. It's all stand-up comedy. It's not the podcast live. It's me and him doing a half hour each and meeting everybody afterwards. Um, if you're not from a regional town, uh, there will be more dates announced. And if you're not from Australia, yes, all of those towns are real. There really are places in Australia called Warnable, Wagga Wagga and Toowoomba, right? Sounds like the noise a fucking cartoon would make in a in one of those shit um one of those like shit Christian made Bible studies cartoons like Veggie Tales or something where there'd be a weird character called Toowoomba and he would just make or the only thing he would do is say Toowoomba and then Moses would come and part the Red Sea or the Red Soup or however they would do it, put a bit of a spin on it for the fucking kids. Yeah, keep them entertained while all the all the clergy root them. Um, what, whatever they do, you know. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to be there. Tickets are on sale. LouisSpears.com slash gigs. If you are not in Australia and you want to see my stand-up, check out my comedy special, LouisSpears.com slash watch. For the next two weeks, 50% of all the proceeds are going directly to the RFS, our volunteer firefighting service, who are currently battling some of the worst fires of my lifetime. Uh, they do a great job and it's all unpaid. So uh, I'm going to be giving 50% of the proceeds. And of those proceeds... I'm going to match every single uh, dollar up to $1,000 because uh, I want to fucking help out because those men and women deserve it, all right? So what's been happening here? I wanted to, this is what I wanted to get into, okay? This is something I actually have prepared, yeah? Um, and, and by that, I actually don't have it prepared. Or maybe I do. Maybe it's on my phone, guys. I wanted to talk about Ricky Gervais at the Golden Globes, his, uh, his monologue. Here it is. I've got it here. Ricky Gervais's uh, monologue uh, stand-up at the Golden Globes was fucking next-level incredible. That was some of the... I think, like, he's one of the best writers of all time in terms of comedy. Like, the jokes that he was pulling out in seven minutes. It was only seven minutes. Like, you think about how many incredibly viral 30-second bits you've seen on Twitter and Instagram and all that shit. That was all pulled from just seven minutes of stand-up. Every single joke he put in there hit hard. And, the, and, and what I love about it was it was such a fuck you to every person who doesn't want... Uh, the edgy, controversial humor to be out there. And it was, I love, I, I put it on my Twitter. I said, uh, Ricky Gervais is kicking open the door of comedy straight into the faces of those who would prefer it be closed. Some of the reactions to the jokes were absolutely hilarious. My favorite was Tom Hanks, right? And this, and I, I put it on Twitter as well, this image of uh, Tom Hanks, right? Just making this face. Whoop. Just like, and Ricky Gervais wasn't even doing a very controversial joke. He just said, accept your award, uh, thank your agent and your God, and fuck off. That's all he said, right? Not a very controversial thing, but he did say fuck. And Tom Hanks goes, oh, he makes that face. Ridiculous. <laughs> just so funny. Like the kind of face you would make if you were at a wedding and someone actually stood up when they say, does anyone have any objections? I fucked her. You know, like if someone did that at a wedding, I would make that face. I think that's the only time I would make that face. No, no, no. There is another scenario. I would also make that face if someone stood up and went, I fucked her. But I was at like a funeral. You know, I'd probably make that face as well. I might, I might go, holy shit, he fucked her. Um, because that's just disrespectful. <laughs> well, what I loved about that, right, was Ricky Gervais goes, accept your award. Thank your agent and your God. And fuck off. Tom Hanks in the audience. It cuts to the crowd. Tom Hanks is making this face. Oh. <laughs> and then right behind him. What's his name? Nicole Kidman's husband. Keith Urban. Keith Urban. That's right. My girl's here. She's unfortunately has to sit through this while she tries to. Yeah, she's waving. 
while she tries to focus on her work, right? Uh, Keith Urban. I always forget this shit. Keith Urban is right behind Tom Hanks going, oh, pissing himself, laughing his head off, right? And I think that is that really points out the difference between America and Australia is when someone tells you to fuck off as a joke, an American will go, oh, and get offended. An Australian will go, ha, good one. You got me, you dirty cunt. Fair enough. You know, when I was in America, I had to tone down the swearing so much. Like, so, so much. I had to tone it down. I felt like I was walking around like a robot, just trying not to swear. I think I said, uh, I think I said, fuck yeah, in conversation. I was in New York, and I was with this, this, a few New Yorkers, bunch of guys, couple girls that I just met, and one of the girls was like, she grew up in a really religious family, I think... I don't know if it was Texas, but it was like Texas vibes. I don't know American geography very much. I don't think anybody can really know it that well. You guys have like 60,000 countries within your country and you expect everyone to know 50 states. Who the fuck has 50 states? Right? You're 50 countries, America. Get it sorted. Um, one of That vibe, right? And I said, fuck yeah. And she said, can you, can you not swear? And this was like, this wasn't like in a library. This was just a Friday night. People were having drinks and dinner. And I said, fuck yeah. And she goes, can you not swear? I was shocked. I almost flipped the table. What'd you say, cunt? This is my fucking language. You know, I should have gone, I should go, you trying to oppress my culture? You're lucky I didn't say, fuck yeah, cunt. <laughs> Offended a lot of people. But that Ricky Gervais speech was so fucking good, man. Like, at, like, as a comedian, it was, like, really refreshing. It was really great to see, not just, like, Ricky Gervais do that, because that's, like, you know, R Ricky's doing Ricky. He'll always do that, and that's fucking great. He's brilliant. But not just Ricky doing that, but also Ricky getting approved by executives. In Like, that's about as, the Golden Globes, about as mainstream media as you can get. It's on a mainstream television network, and it's for, let's be honest, mainstream celebrities. It's not for us plebs. It's not for us fucking, you know, real job working people. I, yeah, real job working people, I say, as I make my money saying cunt in a red chair I got from Ikea. Yeah, that's a real job. There's some guy listening to this while he, while he fucking cuts up dead animals in a slaughterhouse and goes, yeah, you have a real job, bro. Good on you. I have PTSD for minimum wage. Wasn't a fair trade. Fuck you, comedian cunt. But I've had real jobs. Ricky was making the point that a lot of these celebrities have been like day one celebrities, like child star actors moved on to A-list shit, right? That was kind of a big, a big theme of his, of his uh, act or his seven-minute monologue was, why are you guys lecturing us? Because Ricky Gervais grew up poor, from what I understand, very poor, and he worked for years being broke as well. It wasn't like he was poor and then he was rich one day. He was like 40, making like okay money, and then the office happened. Um, so I think he's like a real one. And he was basically saying like, who are you to lecture the rest of the world? None of you live in it, right? And uh, of course it offends all of the fucking celebrities in there. What was the point I was trying to make? Oh, it was, yeah, it was, just, it was so good to see as a comedian that there is still... Like, there is such a desire for that. It's obviously, I thought that, and I know that because of you guys supporting my shit, but, but it was so good to see, like, regular normal people really celebrating real comedy for once. You know, comedy that doesn't hold back, stand up that's, that's, that's put out there knowing that it will offend people. Not intended to offend, because comedy never should be to offend. It should be to make people laugh. But sometimes that laugh comes at the expense of offending, whether it's the subject or, or, or anybody, you know. And it was really cool to see not only Ricky do that, but also a huge mainstream avenue approve that and put it out as, as uncensored as it could be, right? I think they censored minge and fuck, but that's the only words they censored. They let all of the jokes go through. So I think that's, that was, that's so good. And it was a real, 
like kick in the face to all of those people who would who would rather that comedy just die basically uh, it was cool to see it exist in a place that's not just the internet you know I mean, it is Ricky Gervais who could get cancelled uh, tomorrow. I mean, he could fucking, he could do a Harvey Weinstein and be totally fine because Harvey Weinstein, you know, he's going to be a millionaire for the rest of his life. It's not like, you know, if you own a business and you kill six people, you still own the business, right? Maybe you don't work there every day, but on paper, they can't take that away from you. Like if Steve Jobs, if we find out, right, if one day someone goes digging and they find 35 dead bodies that Steve Jobs killed, it's not like they're going to take away the residual earnings from his family. Like they, they still get that money. So what I'm saying is, guys, if you have to murder someone, maybe become a millionaire first, you know? Like consider that. Don't kill people, but if you have to, enter the lottery, yeah? Because they, they can send you to jail. They can't take your money. I think. Or can they? Maybe they... No, I think they can only take your money if it's like proceeds of crime. Like if you got them... If you killed someone and then stole their money, no good. You don't get to keep that. But if you start a successful window washing company, right? And then you go on to start uh, a, a big chain of... Uh, of burrito vendors and you create the best burrito ever and everyone goes, oh my God, Bob's burritos are the best. Uh, and then you, one day you decide to poison every single burrito on all of your 350 restaurants and 165,000 people die because they're that popular and that poisonous. And on the same day, right, you would only lose the millions that you made from Bob's burritos, right? Bob's window washing, all good. Stack it up. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that was so cool. I think uh, Ricky Gervais, like, really proved that he's one of the best writers in comedy still. I saw this ad, man. Oh, I'll tell you what I've been up to. I went away for New Year's. Never try and do a big thing for New Year's. That's what I've learned. If you try and do, like, a big event for New Year's Eve, it's just going to suck. Me and my girl, we, we've tried this. We've tried it like four or five different ways trying to make something of New Year's where we try like one night we went to a big nightclub where we bought expensive tickets and went to this nightclub and then we were just fucking trapped in a nightclub for like four hours waiting for fucking midnight. Because if you spent like $50, $60 on tickets to the nightclub, you don't want to leave. You don't know if there's any better options out there. You don't know if you're going to get to the next place you want to go to and it'll be full. You don't want to be out in the street just trapped with all of the plebs who didn't buy their tickets. So we were stuck in one nightclub for like four hours. For some reason, some chick off the Real Housewives of Melbourne rocked up at some point and they announced her like she was the president. Like, oh, and now it's, uh, it's that one of the chicks from Real Housewives of Melbourne and everybody went, oh, is it that one? Is it the one who's the lawyer that we don't really know the name of, but she still kind of is the favorite? And they went, no, it's the blonde chick. And everyone went, oh, who gives a fuck, bro? And no one cared. I remember the one cool thing of that entire night. Like we were in a nightclub for fucking four hours and I don't drink, right? And I don't do ecstasy. So I don't enjoy nightclubs, right? It's just, it's just basically standing in a room with, and, and just suffering from sensory overload for four hours, sweating with a bunch of people who are only really enjoying themselves because they've been chemically altered to do so. Yeah, like you wouldn't, like you would not enjoy, I, I've done it, right? I've tried many times to enjoy a nightclub sober. I've been many times. Here's the thing. You like it for 25 minutes, approximately four to five songs, right? And then you just want to leave. Yeah, you have, a, you have enough time to have one lemon lime bitters and one water and then think, oh, should I get another drink? Nah, I don't really want to have that much sugar. Makes me feel weird. Do I want another water? Nah, I just had a water. Oh, well, I've done everything there is to do here. Dude, going to a nightclub when you're 25, sober, don't do drugs and have a girlfriend? I might as well fucking behead myself in the library. 
that would be more entertaining. At least I got to figure out a way to cut my own head off with paper, you know? Shh. You can cut your head off. Just don't fucking talk. Sorry. I was, I was trying to get some, can you help me? No. I'm a librarian, not a fucking executioner. I'm not going to help you chop your head off. Besides, you're gonna, it's going to be loud. You're going to make a mess. People will scream. Do it outside. I can't. I was trying to make an analogy for how much a nightclub sucks. And now I'm in a library trying to cut my head off with paper. Are you sure that's an analogy? I don't think that's what an analogy is. Yeah, let's be honest, I've kind of dug myself into a hole here. Should we get out of the pit? Yeah, let's get out of the pit. What I'm saying is nightclubs suck. The one good thing that happened on New Year's, the one good thing, we were at this nightclub and it was one of those things where it was like most of the people down on the dance floor, on the D floor, and there was a bar, but then above us there was like a 360 degree indoor balcony that everyone could kind of chill out at. And then one, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, right? This was, by the way, after midnight. This was not like before midnight. Because after midnight, it starts to kind of wind down. Like, oh, we, like you're not going to top it. You know, you're not going to top the three, two, one, kissing your loved ones or, you know, whichever unfortunate girl who got backed into a corner. You always see that on New Year's, don't you? Like, like just, like, you see... You know what New Year's is for single people? It's like chess. Everyone's trying to manoeuvre themselves into the best position possible to get a checkmate. The checkmate being the woman you just met agreeing to kiss you, right? And But they're opposing players because the woman is always trying to... She's like a... She's the queen, right? Very manoeuvrable, very powerful, holds all the power in this situation. And it's basically 35 pawns trying to check a queen. <laughs> and they can only move one square. And it's not like the queen versus all of the pawns. Every single pawn is on their own team. They're all individual. White ones, black ones, green ones. They, the only thing they all have in common is that they're all very desperate and they're against each other. So it's a bunch of pawns moving one square, getting in, in each other's ways, trying to trap the queen in the corner while she just left and right rejects every single pawn peasant that doesn't meet her standard, right? But eventually, right, when 1159 comes along, she's running out of options and she's backed into a corner. She's got to pick. And all these pawns are like dancing around, pumping one fist in the air. The other hand, they're looking at their watch, trying to get in position to make it so that she's the that they are the only person she can kiss without being seen like that's what they're doing. So they can't get, you know, like you can't get close at 11.59, 10 seconds. You want to get there at 11.59, 54 that's where you want to get close. If you get a, get close at 11.59.10, she's going to look at you, use her four seconds to step away from you. And you can't go again because then it's just, then you're getting kicked out of the club, hands behind your back by security. And you know what? Fair enough. So you want to get there at 11.59.56. 57 even. So she only has three seconds. <clears throat> To look to her left, right, behind her and make the choice. And then she just has to settle. I don't know why the fuck chicks go to nightclubs. Why would you do that to yourself? I couldn't imagine. Or like because I go to because I've been to clubs many times just dead sober, instead of, you know, I've given up on trying to have fun, what I've decided to do is just people watch. That's how I entertain myself. And uh as someone, as one of the few people who can remember every single thing that has happened every single time I've been to a nightclub, right? I really am the authority on nightclubs. People might think, oh, you don't drink, you don't do drugs, so you don't really know what's going on. It's like, cunt, you only know 30% of what goes on. You forgot 70% of the other stuff, and then you hallucinated an extra 20%. 
So you think you know half the story, but really 20% of it was made up and 70% of it was forgotten. You're left with 30, a vibe. I know what happens at this nightclub, these nightclubs. You know what happens? It's just cunts walking in, chewing their gums off, trying to stick their fingers in a woman while girls dance with their friends and get sexually harassed. That's what a nightclub is, and it's not fun. I don't know why women do that to themselves. There needs to be women-only clubs. You know why they do it? Because if there were women-only clubs, right, which I'm sure many people have tried to build it, but you need those endorphins, yeah? Yeah. As much as you hate gross guys, fuck, it's a bit of a self-esteem boost when someone hits on you. Because I know, I've been hit on, not much, but it's happened. It's amazing. It's the best feeling in the world. And guys never get it. I reckon, honestly, it's happened under 10 times in my life, right? Sometimes you get it after shows, that happens all the time, but that doesn't count, right? Power dynamics off. I'm talking organic, in the street, stranger to stranger, I think you're hot, I'm going to hit on you. The only time it happened consistently, and I do, a, I do a joke about this in my act, so I'm not going to go into it. The only time it happened consistently was when I was in America, because for some reason they think the Australian accent is attractive, right? I know they're wrong. And also I know I'm not the hottest person in the room, so they're, they're, their ears don't work and neither do their eyes. But it did happen, and it feels fucking amazing. I couldn't imagine the self-esteem boost you get when you walk into a nightclub and 70% of the people there want to fuck you, even the taken ones. You must walk out feeling like queen of the world. Or you walk out feeling like a victim because you've just been sexually harassed by 70% of the club and everybody who brushes past you. A little bit too close. I don't know. It must be... You know what? It's a mixed bag. It's a bit of a gamble. And hey, Australians love a gamble. We've worked it out, guys. That's why chicks go to nightclubs, because chicks love gambling. You know what? That's why you never see women at at Crown Casino gambling away their mortgage. Because they get their gambling done in the club. You know, you do see women, right? But you only see old women, pensioners, gambling. And that's... Not because they're lonely and bored. It's because no one hits on them when they go to the club. Do you reckon you would even be let in if you were like a 70-year-old pensioner at a nightclub? I think you, you should not be let in on safety. Like just health regulations. Shouldn't, you shouldn't let fucking 70-year-old pensioners in nightclubs. That's definitely a health hazard. Although, really, anybody over 25 in a nightclub is a, is a senior citizen. You know, there's, there's, it's, seven, it's 17 and up, right? With all the fake IDs floating around in Australia. 17 and up exclusively. What am I saying? Oh, yeah. The one good thing that happened on New Year's. Welcome to the podcast. If you knew, it's me, basically me trying to finish a sentence for an hour. And it just really unravels. So if you knew, that's the podcast, Speared Sundays. And if you're a returning visitor, welcome, right? I know, you'd, I know you're used to garbage. Did you notice how I'm already away from what happened on New Year's? Fuck you, I'm over here. I'm more excited by this, right? If you're, if you're a, a returning visitor to Speared Sundays, welcome back, right? Love you, okay? Now, obviously, quite a big change to what you're used to. What you're used to, looking at garbage. Now, what did we talk about last episode? We're going to be grateful for nice things. Not angry, right? Because I know you guys hate change, right? But let's be honest, right? If if you get angry at me changing my podcast set for the better, to live a better life, to create better content, to attract more listeners and grow this podcast, if you're angry at that, right, a positive change in my life, here's the deal. If you're angry at my positive change, in 30, 40 years' time, hopefully it doesn't happen, right? I hope to God this never happens to you. But if, right, and I hope it doesn't happen, but if it does, and I re- honestly, I hope that it does not, because this would be awful. But if it does, and I hope it won't, but also statistically, 
There are many thousands of people listening to this podcast. It's going to happen to some of you, right? And I hope that it doesn't. I hope this is a statistical anomaly and I hope it happens to none of you. But I, I've seen the stats. It's going to happen to some. And out of the sum that it happens to, if you're angry that I've improved my podcast, if this happens to you, which I hope that it doesn't, but if this does happen to you, if you get cancer, <laughs> and it gets, and you, and, and you, and you, <laughs> if, you <laughs> if you get cancer, I hope you don't try and fix it. Because obviously you, don't like improving things that are cancer. So you, I hope you stand by your core beliefs and you, don't, you go, you know what? I might have stage one. We caught it early. It's very preventable. I, you know what? I, I caught it very early. It's not in my lungs. It's not in my nuts. It's not in my tits. I caught it very early. But you know what? 20 years ago when Lewis Spears upgraded his podcast set. I complained about it. So I'm going to stand by my belief system and I'm not going to improve a bad thing. I, instead of getting chemotherapy and getting rid of this preventable cancer, what I'm instead going to do is hit the fucking beach, no sunscreen. I hope that's what happens to you. If you're angry about positive change, I hope you hit the beach, no sunscreen. And let's just see what happens. Hopefully it doesn't happen. But also... Let's hit the beach no sunscreen and see what happens. Speaking of the beach, man, I saw an ad, right? That made me so angry. How long are we going here? 32 minutes. Made me so angry, right? Made me so mad. I saw an ad. It's summer here in Australia, right? Surprise, America, you're not the only country in the world, right? We got seasons too and they're the opposite of yours. Can't tell you how many fucking morons have written in my comment section when I talk about how hot it is. It's not hot. It's winter. Hey, bro. The world's round. Fuckhead. It's a big planet, dude. Did you know some people don't even speak English? Oh, it's fucking blown your mind, haven't I? Anyway. Also, metric systems retarded. Fix it. Um, no. What? Oh, metric, hey, hey, thank God Jazz is in here because the comment section would have gone off, right? Metric system, <laughs> that's what we use, right? Whatever you use, yards, feet, Celsius, no way, Fahrenheit, Celsius is what we use. Guys, let's be honest. The only reason why I know that you're such a dumb cunt is because I, I recognize when things are very much like me, all right? What I'm saying is I saw an advertisement that annoyed me. Let's forget about all that nonsense. Let's move on, right? Like the New Year's Eve story, the cool thing that happened, let's move on from that. I saw an ad that made me so mad, right? It's summer, it's really hot. It's like, it was like a 45 degree Celsius day. Not Fahrenheit, Celsius, all right? Fahrenheit, well, like Fahrenheit get fucked. Celsius, right? Really hot here in Australia, summer. And there is an ad, right? Giant billboard. KFC is doing a massive fucking advertising campaign. And it's just a picture of a big 20-piece bucket. They're big 20-piece. Massive 20-piece bucket of chicken. And all it says, it's just, just the picture, KFC logo. And it says, bucket at the beach? Why not? Hey, KFC, why not? I'll fucking tell you why. Who the fuck would eat a bucket of chicken at the beach? What kind of fucking animal? If I saw someone roll up to the beach with a 20-piece bucket of fried chicken from KFC, you know what I would do? I would roll them out to sea because obviously we have a beached whale on our hands. Why not? Dude, could you imagine, imagine, right, honestly, three-piece box, I'll allow it. I'll allow a three, a 20-piece box on the fucking beach. How many cunts are you bringing to the beach? Ten? 
No, that's, that is fat cunt behavior and I will not stand for it. And neither will they. Because <laughs> they don't stand for much, do they? Dude, if you took a bucket of chicken to the fucking beach, can you imagine how much sand would just get in it? Like, you can't smash it a 20-piece bucket quickly. Even with five friends, that is an endeavor. That's not, that's taking at least like 30 minutes, minimum. And at the beach, you're not like sitting and just eating. So more likely, that's an hour minimum if you have five friends situation. Can you imagine how much fucking sand would get in your 20-piece bucket? You would have to sit there and make sure that no one around you runs or moves anywhere near the fucking chicken. The amount of seagulls that would swoop you trying to eat one of their own because they think it's chips and not, you know, their cousins. Why not? Hey. Because if you bring a bucket of chicken to the fucking beach, you'll be rolled out to sea and it'll go viral on Twitter from all these humanitarian people rolling out a fucking beached whale while he goes, no, stop it. You're getting sand in my chicken. (laughs) That's why not. (laughs) And that's biggest problem that I've had this month is seeing a KFC bucket ad that pissed me off. That's the, that my life is so good. You ever think about that? You ever think about the things that make you angry and, and then realize, fuck, my life is so good. I'm getting angry at KFC ads. That was my biggest problem all Christmas was why the fuck? fuck would you bring chicken to the beach you know what like people's problems in starving third world countries is why the fuck would you bring the chicken to me and then they just die that that's their like where the fuck is the chicken that's their biggest and meanwhile i'm screaming at advertisements for 40 minutes on a fucking podcast in a red chair that i didn't build correctly And you know what your biggest problem is? That I upgraded this set. And if that's your biggest problem and you hate positive change, I hope it doesn't happen to you, but go to the beach, no sunscreen, with a big bucket of chicken and, hey, let's see what happens. Let's see. Hopefully nothing happens, but you know what? Let's see. Let's fucking find out. Enjoy your chicken. Because if there's one thing that could double your rates of cancer, it's sitting on the beach eating KFC, no sunscreen, 45 degree heat. And let's fucking see. All right? Now, coolest thicken thing that happened, coolest thicken that happened on New Year's Eve. This was after the fireworks. You would think that nothing could top the fireworks, the moment itself, passing into a new year. The celebration, everyone coming together in the world as one to celebrate a new year, new year, new me, right? You'd think that nothing could top that from an event perspective. At about 1.30 a.m., some dude on the balcony, right? This massive 6'3", ripped, shirtless black dude steps onto the balcony with a fucking saxophone and just starts playing it not plugged into the sound system while the dj plays his own music and this dude for 40 minutes just plays the fucking sax along with club bangers for 40 minutes dancing that's the best shit i've ever seen in my fucking life do you have any input jazz was here yeah. 15 minutes ago, I knew what was going to happen, but I legitimately thought that you had forgotten because you got so sidetracked. I, I had no idea. I was like, well, that's gone. I was like, should I remind him about this sex I literally hey, thought. I know what I'm doing. You were talking about getting cancer on the beach. Yep. And you know what, Jazz? If you're unhappy with how I tell my stories, 
How about you go down to the beach, no sunscreen, and let's see. I'll definitely get cancelled. <laughs> yeah, you will. Red hair. Um, You'd be over in twenty minutes. You'd be well done. This guy was the best part of. Oh, by far the best part. Like if you're at a, um, if you're at a nightclub that doesn't have a guy playing the saxophone. Yeah. Like just riffing a melody on top of club tracks. Your night then sucked. It's not worth going out. No way. No. Yeah. Who is the dancing? Oh no, I got them confused. The sax guy was not dancing. No, sax he was vibing. Sax guy but was just yeah, he was just playing. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Very what was it? This black guy who's wearing all gold. Oh, okay. No, it was a white guy playing the sax, yeah, yeah. and then it was a then it was a separate black dude, no shirt. No, he was. We had an open shirt. Yeah, it was like all gold outfit, gold. liquid gold outfit, and he was like. He was like a was, ballet. He was dancing the he, ballet. He wasn't the ballet. He was pirouetting. Oh, he was pirouetting. He was... It, I th actually, I don't think it was a ballet. I think the only thing he did was pirouette for 40 minutes to the sax and the DJ music. Vibing yeah. the music so hard. I think he'd mashed together every dance style in the world. Yeah. And was somehow dancing them all at once. Here's what I think happened, and right? the whole club was staring at him. He, yeah. Like, I don't know if they were getting paid because the sax guy was not plugged into the sound system. So I feel like it, it could, it, they could have been a paid thing, but I feel like if it was a paid plan thing, surely you would do that before midnight because most people were leaving, right? This is like 1.30. This was after fireworks. Most people were leaving. So I thought I would think that if this was a planned thing, you would do that entertainment before New Year's when people can see it instead of after. I think I feel like this was spontaneous. I feel like he just rocked up with a sax and, and a classically trained ballerina on Molly and was like, let's fucking do it. Oh, he must have been on drugs yeah. he just kept going. 40 minutes. We, we were going to leave and then we, we kind of just were like, just let's see how long this guy can dance for. He was just no breaks, no water. No breaks, no water. Sweating like nothing I've ever seen in my life from the exertion, but also, let's be honest, the molly. <laughs> it was incredible. That's the best thing I've seen on, on New Year's, all right? Um, okay, we've been going about 40 minutes here. Sorry. Um, let's get into a uh, miscellaneous bit at the end of the podcast. Uh, if you Oh, and next episode, I'm going to talk about all the new Epstein photos. I've run out of time. I, I'm going to have to spend so much time on it. I'm going to talk about the Epstein shit. I know it's been coming out. Everyone's been messaging me about it. I will talk about the Epstein shit. Uh, next episode, stick around for that. But uh, let's get into miscellaneous bit at the end. And holy fuck, guys, I've been saving this one, right? And you guys know whenever I save one, it's a good one. And <laughs> I struggle calling this one good because it is a reprehensible one. If you don't know... Um, the miscellaneous bit at the end is the part of the podcast uh, that everyone hates. Worst part of the podcast, it is where I answer life advice questions from listeners of the show. If you would like to send in an email, send it through to podcast at lewspears.com. Summarize your issue in the title and then uh, write it. Try and keep it precise if you can because if it's, uh, if it's a novel, hey, go and write a book. I ain't reading it. Um. Miscellaneous bit at the end, podcast at lewspears.com is the email. Um, okay, here we are. So, I have here, this one's just come in. We'll do this one, and then we'll get to the good one. This one here. I think I made someone a pedophile accidentally <laughs> from a girl listener of the show, right? And as we know, girls have the best stories when they contribute. Actually, not this episode. We've got a guy with a fucking ripper, but let's see how this girl goes. Um, G'day, cunt. I've been a fan of the podcast since episode five. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the new set. Otherwise, hey, hit the beach. Let's see. Um, I'm a 17-year-old girl who dropped out of, a, out of school a month before I turned 16, studied a diploma of early childhood education and spent six months trying to push my way up and now I am room leader of a 0 to 1.5-year-old room. Well done. Well done. Uh, I am the youngest employee at the childcare centre I work at by about three years. That's fucking sick. But also... Why did you need to try that hard to be in charge of things that are zero? 
as long as you don't throw them at a fucking wall, I'm pretty sure you're doing a good job. Feed them, don't step on them. Isn't that all you got to do? Oh, don't molest them. Yeah, you would need three years of training for that. My problem. About two months ago, a colleague of mine introduced me to one of... Yeah, that three, year, I, <laughs> that three years is like the, like, is like the test, you know? Because surely horny cunts would get over it in like a month and just give up. Three years of training, I'm like, ah, I'll just break into a daycare at another date. Fuck that. About two, <laughs> about two months ago, a colleague of mine introduced me. I think I made someone a pedo accident. Hang on. I hope you didn't accidentally make one of the co-workers fuck one of the kids. How does that happen? Whoops, I slipped and my pants fell down. No, whoops, I slipped, pulled your pants down and threw a baby at your cock. Yeah, maybe you shouldn't be working there. <laughs> About two months ago, a colleague of mine... Oh, this isn't good. A colleague of mine introduced me to one of her brothers, Tom. We hit it off and started fucking. Yeah, I can tell this girl's Australian. Our first problem was we both live at home and have religious parents, so we could not do it at each other's houses. So we did, mo did the most 17-year-old thing possible and fucked in the bushes and parks at night. Fuck, that is so 17-year-old Australia, just fingering some girl in a fucking bush. That's definitely not the first time I've heard that story. Oh, no, that shit, that shit went on like, that was rampant for sure in my high school, and I wasn't in on any of it. As, much, as hard as I tried, I never lived that experience. And you know what? For some reason, I'm disappointed, but also I know that it would not have been good. We did the most 17-year-old thing possible and had sex in bushes and parks at night. Fast forward six weeks and he starts telling me it's his 24th birthday tomorrow. Oh, no! 24? And you didn't know? As soon as Tom said that, I freaked the fuck out, said I was feeling sick, and when I went home, I had a panic attack. Tom looks 18, lives at home, and parties like an 18, 19-year-old. I've ghosted him, but I'm 18 in two weeks. Is it okay for me to be sleeping with a guy who was sleeping with me when I was a minor, or should I just pretend I never did that? I hope this makes sense at all. Have an incredibly shit one, Jay. Yeah. Look, Jay, okay. I'm going to be honest, right? I think we're going to say the same thing. He fucking knew. There's no way he didn't know. That's why he didn't tell you he was 24 for six weeks. You didn't find out his age. It never came up. Six weeks, he did not tell you. He fucking knew. He did not tell you. So no, it's not okay. It, look, it's not, you're not the problem. You're a child that got taken advantage of, right? Not, not sexually assaulted, but like intentionally misled, I would say, at the least. It's not you have nothing to feel bad about. He's gross. What do you think, Jazz? Um, which state does she live in? And, and that's another thing. I think in, I think, all states of Australia, the age of consent is 16. Yeah. Like, if you're 16, you can have sex legally with a 90-year-old. Wouldn't recommend it. Not that I've done it. Actually, you know what? Hey, let's see. <laughs> Live your life. No, but in Australia, if you are Australian... It's 16 everywhere. You don't have to worry about... There's no laws broken. Child. Yeah. But what he did was still skeezy. Yeah, what he did is very sleazy and I definitely wouldn't trust the dude. I think, you know what? There's nothing to feel bad about. The guy's not going to do jail time and you're not a bad person. You haven't accidentally made him a pedophile. I'm going to be honest. He fucking knew. Yeah, that's your biggest that's, issue. Yes. Your biggest issue is fucking in a bush. I mean, if, if there is no bed or safe place for you to be able to get fucked, simple. You don't get fucked. Yeah. Like, dude, he's 24. He can afford a hotel room. <laughs> At least a motel. Yeah. 
any 24-year-old dude who's fucking children in a bush is not someone you want to hang out with, right? You don't go for round 16 or whatever you guys are up to. Also, because he fucking knew. Massive red herring with her telling you that she was a children a child care provider with the title of their email. What do you mean? It made it sound like she fucked one of the kids. Oh yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And all, and also structure your emails a little bit better. <laughs> Hey, started off with, hey, Lewis, I didn't fuck a child and neither did any of my friends. But please enjoy the story. Maybe start, maybe, the, okay, biggest problem, fucking an adult male in a bush, yeah? Problem number one. Problem number two, uh, writing comprehension. That's it, second. So maybe, right, stop fucking this dude and use the time that you've saved in the bushes studying grammar and writing. That's that's why she dropped out of high school. It's not none maybe, of these problems are your fault. Maybe she wasn't there when they taught them not to fuck in bushes. Yeah, she missed the lesson on how to how to preface emails and how to not fuck adult males in the bush. <laughs> who are who deaf? Let me tell you, I'm 25, so I'm not far off this guy. I know a 17 year old when I see a 17 year old. Even even if they look older, I know how they act. Yeah. A 17-year-old who looks 30. There's a few of them, right? There's a couple of dudes walking around that play like rugby and shit. They look 50. They're that fucking built. But if I talk to them, right? And not that I would ever in my life talk to a rugby player. But if I were to, you know. So he knew, right? You're not the problem. There's nothing for you. You don't have to feel bad about anything. This is all on him. And I think don't see him again. Because, uh the last thing you want is for him to be like, all right, 16 went pretty well. Let's try 15. That guy's gross. Tell them the next email. Incredibly suspect. Now it's time. You thought that one was bad. Welcome to fucking Spearhead Sundays. If you thought the previous email was bad, holy shit. Let's get into this. Now, I'm going to preface this email with... I do not approve of any of this behavior. And you guys know me. I very rarely say that on this podcast. I generally go, hey, I wouldn't do it, but go for your life. I think this is a bad thing to do. The email is called Retarded Romp. <laughs> Lewis has already told me this story and oh my God. Retarded Romp. This is from a man that I'm going to call Tom because he sh it, no one needs to know this, Tom. Hey, Lou. Love your shit. So about half an hour ago. So he, he, sent, me, he sent me this at 9.40 p.m. So approximately December 31, 10 past 9 p.m. Oh, so this is how we brought in the fucking new decade. <laughs> Don't you remember? Oh, this was his New Year's. Yeah. Oh, that's right. This is what we did on New Year's. Yeah. We read this. We read this. Oh, fuck. New Year's Eve. Was it just before midnight or just after? It was happened at 9.10. I received the email 9.40 and he started it with half an hour ago. <laughs> so this is what... I want you guys to know, right? Before I read this email, this is what Tom did New Year's Eve. He sat down and thought about this. Hey, Lou. Love your shit. So about half an hour ago... I just went to meet a 28-year-old mentally challenged guy I met off Grinder. In my defense, I did not realize that he was mentally challenged. He said on Grinder that he lived alone and could host. And from the way he typed, I thought he was either, either dyslexic or drunk. Not that bad. Anyway, I rock up to his house knock on the door, and he answers very wide-eyed and quickly ushers me into his room, and I know straight away something is up. He lived with his family. So we start kissing and stuff. He was an awful kisser. Gee, I wonder why. Could it be because he's retarded? And I go down on him. Then he says he wants me to fuck him, so I try and get it up so I can do it and get the hell out of here. All of a sudden... <laughs> All of a sudden, his door bursts open and his mother asks, what's going on? Thankfully, she did not see me and he just tells her he was jerking off. 
After a minute, she leaves and he makes me go inside his closet. After 20 minutes, he finally lets me out the front door and I make a mad dash to my car. As I'm driving off, I see his mother standing out the front door getting my number plate and taking photos of my car. I get home and I see this message on my Grindr account and he's attached a screenshot. This is real. The screenshot says, Hey, Sensor, this is Sensor's mother. Don't ever, and I mean ever, come anywhere near my house again. We seen who you are and the car you drive. Delete my son before I get police involved. He is mentally challenged. <laughs> Bro, this guy fucked a retard on New Year's Eve. Dude, that is insane. So immediately I, I email him back and I go, okay, I never email back generally, but how did this, how did you organize this in the first place? Did you know the guy was disabled? How did the grinder convo go? Do you have, and did you have no other options? As much info as possible, please. This is momentous is what I said. And he says, Tom says, Okay, I talked to him a few weeks ago on Grinder, but I bailed on the meetup several times. I didn't realize he was disabled. The conversation was basically him saying, you fuck me tonight and other weird, but not too weird for Grinder sentences. I had a route lined up earlier that day, so I took a Viagra because I have trouble getting it up in the first place, but that person canceled. <laughs> So you were just sitting there on New Year's Eve with a dick like steel and an empty calendar and you were like, well, I guess I'm fucking the guy who wears a helmet. Bro, you're a bad person. I've been blue, I had been blue ballsing all afternoon and nobody else on Grindr had hit me up because it was New Year's Eve. I was desperate. This guy messaged me again. And I bit the bullet and drove the 40 minutes to his house. I reckon that's the funniest thing about this is that you had to drive home for 40 minutes with, with a massive erection, with a massive Viagra-induced erection, sitting in your car, realizing, holy shit, I just had sex with a mentally challenged person and his mum took photos of my license plate. Am I going to end up in a Facebook group? As you know, mums with children like that, they need support from other mothers. They're in groups. Maybe you're in a group, bro. Have you thought about that? Some group with like 9,000 mums with mentally challenged sons going, hey, my son's mentally challenged and I just found out he's on Grinder. A strange man showed up to my house with the hardest direction known to man. Fuck my son, hang, hung out in the closet for 30 minutes. I knew he was there and then left. Bro, that is insane. The craziest thing about that is how easy it is to get laid as a gay dude. You can, you really can just rock up to someone's house and be like, hey, are you Tom? Yep, all right, come on in, let's fuck. Oh, yeah. That's how easy. And you know what? If, that, if, if women were like that, I'd be doing that shit too. Yeah, God God made chicks crazy because otherwise they'd be pregnant 24-7 if they enjoyed, like, Excuse stringless me. sex too Women much. Crazy. Did you hear what that guy did? <laughs> yeah, okay. He took look. a Viagra on the off chance. <laughs> yeah, okay. Day. Okay, look. He just walked around all day with a stiffy. You think look. women are crazy? Okay, ladies. There's nothing wrong with you. Clearly, we're the problem because when we are left to our own devices, when there are no women around, this is what gay men do. They take Viagra and roll the dice that someone will suck their cock because chances are they probably will, right? And they're that desperate that... Dude, what's fucking crazy is that... fair and Okay, fair enough. You meet up with the guy because you don't know that he's disabled. Fair enough, right? But how do you, like, when they answer the door, here's one I would have left, right? Knock on the door. <coughs> door opens. You see the guy. I'm still, like, I knock on the, I roll up. To his, all right. 
I see the poorly worded messages. I'm he I'm still keen. Maybe you can't spell. Yeah? No worries. I pull up to the house. Oh, looks like a normal house. I'm still keen. I knock on the door. Still keen. The door opens. I see the guy. Fully grown male. Looks to be of an age where he can consent. I st- I'm still keen. I look over his shoulder. I see his mum looking horrified, staring at me, pulling out her phone, taking photos of my face. I'm still keen. But when the other guy went, Hello. Get the fuck out of there. What are you doing? The minute I hear that, Hello, I am leaving. How did you not leave as soon as you, as soon as, you know what? Here's when I would have left, right? Even before the, hello, I would have left when he did this. When he did the wave. I'm out of there, bro. I am fucking gone light speed. Han Solo couldn't catch me in the Millennium Falcon. I am gone. What are you doing, dude? That is probably the most heinous story I have ever heard on this fucking podcast. So if you are new to Spearhead Sundays, This is what it is. Welcome. I do a new podcast every Sunday and it is full of some of the most heinous stories you will ever hear in your fucking life. And I, they're all true. And I have heard worse. So welcome. I will talk to you next Sunday. That's the end of the podcast. I'm Lewis Spears. Tickets are on sale, lewispears.com slash gigs. My regional tour is on sale now and my comedy special is available to stream and download on my website, 50% of profits go to the RFS. If you get offended by that story and all my jokes, suck my dick because I'm donating to the Bushfire Relief Fund. I'm Lewis Spears. I'll talk to you next Sunday. Have a shit one.